let me just ask you one more question. Um, are Sims alive? Alive? Um, depends on where you're asking. In the computer, no, I don't think so. But in a lot of people's heads, yeah, they are. The real lesson of The Sims is unharnessing the creative power of grassroots citizens to contribute to the design and development of, of a game. They thought of it from the very beginning as a tool set for people to tell their own stories, to set their own goals, not a kind of rigidly railed interactive experience, but a participatory culture. This participatory culture has resulted in over 200 websites in 14 languages, all dedicated to The Sims and objects you can download into the game. Well, one way to look at this whole community thing is it's like an ecology. And so we have uh, a lot of different fan sites occupying different niches in this ecology. Certain ones are dependent on others. There are all kinds of websites out there with fan-created content, like superhero skins, horror themes, period costumes, and even unpixelated naked sims. Some of the better ones kind of go off in a lot of different directions. There's one called Seven Deadly Sims. And they have custom stuff for the game uh, based around the seven deadly sims. There's another one called Sims Resource, which is pretty much kind of like a superstore of custom skins. There's a great parody of The Onion called The Sim, which is kind of a comedy site. Several news sites that are reporting on the other fan sites. Um, they just go off in all sorts of directions. It's being used more as an expressive tool than as a game. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. I know a lot of hardcore gamers who just hate it. They just hate it. Whoa. The very things that the hardcore people get turned off by are what fascinate the people who, who have made it a phenomenon. Custom, personalized content is used to post original material on TheSims.com. Screenshots can be easily uploaded from the game to the EA website. Whole stories are posted at a rate of about 100 a day. At first they were very simple stories, kind of mainstream about the life of their sim. And then they've gotten much more involved over time. And so now some of the stories are these very elaborate parodies of King Slasher things. You know, we have people telling stories about their local Starbucks and how they hate it, or about how their sister got out of an abusive relationship. This game has become more than the designers ever thought it would. Now, what does the future hold for The Sims? Simsville is a new game we're working on, and it roughly falls between SimCity and The Sims. You can imagine a much more zoomed-in SimCity, where all of the individuals have needs, like The Sims. The Sims Online is going to be a persistent world, you know, online version of The Sims. Um, we're trying to put a lot of emphasis on the, of course, the social interaction, because now every character in the game is a real person. So basically, you'll have one avatar. You won't run a whole family. You'll run one character. And uh, you can build a house. You, know, you don't have to build a house. You can build uh, any environment you want. We're building this community very indirectly. You know, we're sitting here designing a game, but what comes out of the game eventually is this you know, very large, thriving community. Well, one way to look at this whole community thing is it's like an ecology. And so we have uh, a lot of different fan sites occupying different niches in this ecology. Certain ones are dependent on others. So at the top of this pyramid, we have tool makers, which are making, helping us make custom uh, tools to customize the content in the game. From that, actually, are living the content artists. And so a lot of people are taking those tools and then doing really cool things with them. And they're actually feeding a lot of the mainstream websites with their custom content flowing into those. People are going to these mainstream sites, collecting a lot of the custom content, and then using them to tell stories in the game, and coming back to our site and uploading stories that they've used, you know, the custom content to create. And then you have these other sites that are actually reporting upon the activities of all these other layers. And so it's actually a very dynamic system, and it's uh, very fascinating to study from that point of view. That's, that's great. What have you What have you learned or, or noticed from studying this? These uh you're, you're a man whose, whose career has been built on sort of studying sort of the makeup of, of society, things you take for granted. Looking around, you see buildings and streets and, and water and, you know, so things that are around us all the time. But maybe from that vantage point, you studied this, you know, ecology. And what have you kind of learned from it? Well, I've applied different metaphors, of course, from the games I've worked on. I can't help but do that. Um, another way to look at this is like through classic city planning. Um, 
in classic urban economics, you've got uh, usually an industrial base starting off a city, which is uh, exporting to uh, external markets. Um, the city will grow up around that. At some point, you know, as people move in to support, let's say, a factory, they start needing things like grocery stores and gas stations. And so a lot of businesses start springing up just to serve the needs within the community. And at that point, um, the growth becomes self-fueling. So a little bit of growth, you have to add more grocery stores and gas stations and whatnot, and it's a compound growth. And so you see this kind of S-curve, uh, which is indicative of, you know, your typical urban pattern growing fairly unconstrained. But you see the same thing in, like, a fan community like the Sims. You know, you see the same type of growth where, at some point, it becomes self-fueling. At first, people are just putting up sites because they're playing the game and they want to trade stuff for the game. But at some point, the sites are actually uh, trading stuff between themselves or supporting each other. So, for instance, the news reporting sites wouldn't exist if these other sites weren't around. So they're kind of a secondary product. So what's kind of weird is that we're building this community very indirectly. You know, we're sitting here designing a game, but what comes out of the game eventually is this, you know, very large, thriving community. Um, and as we start working on The Sims Online, you know, which we're doing now, we, we're learning a lot of lessons, I think, about the way these communities grow and operate and what the feedback, you know, loops are within them that uh, we're hoping to apply in The Sims Online. Right. We'll get to that in a sec. Um, what are, by the way, this is going to be really cut up, too, so if you want to take a you know, drink or whatever, like, we're not going to run this whole interview. Okay. So we can, you can need to start over or whatever on anything. Um, what was I thinking about? Oh, yeah, specifically as you're looking at this, you know, at the community that's sort of come about, what are some of the stories or, you know, type of sites that have popped up that have caught your attention? Um, yeah, I know there's a lot of stories on your site. and. yeah. It's interesting to me, on our site we have this provision actually in the game where you can create a story by capturing screenshots and then uh, captioning each one. And it makes kind of a comic book-like thing, story. Um, and it's a fairly simple, like, one or two button process to get it on our website to publish it. And then anybody can read it, even if they don't have the game. And it's been very interesting to see the evolution of these stories over time. At first they were very simple stories, kind of mainstream about the life of their sim. Then some of them, some of the uh, players started downloading custom content and making their superhero family or things of that nature. And then they've gotten um, much more involved over time. And so now some of the stories are these very elaborate um, parodies of teen slasher things or even autobiographical. You know, we have people telling stories about their local Starbucks and how they hate it or um, about how their sister got out of an abusive relationship um, and it's very interesting to see the game used in this way. They're kind of using it as a, uh, a diary slash um, catharsis slash uh, exposition for all the other people. You know, by somehow putting this in the game, making a story out of it, and then publishing it for everybody to see, um, a lot of people are finding value in that. And it's really interesting for me to see a game used for that purpose because I, I didn't really expect it with The Sims at all. I mean, it's really taken me by surprise. Definitely. Maybe I can just get you to <coughs> tell a little bit more about a couple of those two examples. Uh, you can tell a little bit about that Starbucks one. I think it's hilarious. Oh, okay. Well, there's one story on our website that's called uh, Starbucks Sucks. And it's this guy, um, and it's he's going on this rant about Starbucks. And it's not Starbucks in general. It's this one particular Starbucks on, like, 47th Avenue in New York City. And uh, he just goes, it's a really long story, like 40 panels. And each one is, like, one particular thing he hates about that Starbucks. And it's like how... People answer their, their cell phone when they're at the head of the line, or how the homeless people come in and drink the cream, or how weird people are always sitting there all day. And he goes on and on. And then at the very last panel, he says, oh, by the way, there's this great little coffee stand a block down the street. <laughs> he gives the name of the coffee stand. And so I couldn't help but wonder who actually posted that story. But uh, that's, you know, one example of the kind of offbeat things that we're getting on our website. That's great. And uh, what about the gingerbread man, man story? Do you remember that one? Yeah. Yeah, you can tell that one, and that would be great. Okay, well, another one, another uh, story on our website is uh, the gingerbread family. And it's heavy on custom content. So most of the stuff in the story was actually done by fans, different skins and wallpapers and stuff. And they actually, they made a gingerbread house, and this gingerbread family moves into the house. And it's the story about how Mr. Gingerbread Man is always paranoid that everybody's trying to eat him. And so every time the neighbors come over to visit, you know, he's always uh, um, assuming the worst, that they're trying to, you know, scheme and plot to eat him. And his wife, you know, of course, this drives a lot of friction with the neighbors, and his wife is always kind of on his back about 
trying to be friendly. And then it turns out that uh, there's this other guy, Molasses Mike, who's a molasses cookie. And in fact, he is out to eat them. And so Mr. Gingerbread Man builds this trap in his backyard and lures uh, Molasses Mike into it and then bakes him in the oven. And that's kind of the end. But uh, it's, uh, you know, you'd have to see it to understand the, the depths to which the fans have sat there and customized, you know, just huge amounts of stuff. Yeah, it's checking that out. It's, it blew me away. I mean, it was just because the hours and hours and hours that must take to do. I mean, it is an art form in a, in, in a way. It's, oh, yeah. It's a hobby. And, you know, what's interesting is to look at all the content that we've created for The Sims, all the objects and characters and wallpapers, um, which is a lot. You know, we've had teams of artists on it for a couple of years now. And at this point, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what the fans have created. Because um, when, you know, you have a million people out there doing something like that, you know, they can just make tremendous progress. So. There probably is more fan content um, compared to ours. It's probably about a nine to one ratio or something like that now. Wow, wow, nine to one. Um, and it, the last story, if you could just tell, is the the one of the sister getting out of the abusive relationship. I mean, that was the one you told. Uh, and maybe we could just go into a little more depth on that one. Yeah. Well, actually, one of the most touching stories I've seen on our website is this uh, woman describing how her sister got out of an abusive relationship, got into and out of it. And uh, it's technically not very impressive, and she's not really using any custom content. But you can just tell from the writing that it's so heartfelt. And she describes, you know, how her sister met this guy, and he seemed okay at first, and then later became a jerk, and then he started verbally abusing her, and it eventually became physical, and how she had to struggle to get out of it. But eventually she did, and it was kind of, a, you know, a victory. You know, just I think she was trying to show other people that you can get out of these relationships. But it was really interesting to me that she chose to use The Sims to tell this story. And that she obviously wanted to help people, you know, just by communicating what had happened. I think The Sims appeals to a very broad range of uh, experience. A lot of games are very specialized in their sports or warfare or fantasy, whereas The Sims uh, is really about something that everybody's familiar with. It's about everyday life. So everybody can come to the game with a certain set of expectations and, you know, some amount of knowledge about the system. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's very approachable, and it's, it almost feels like a dollhouse, like an interactive dollhouse where the dolls have come alive, and then you can do all sorts of experiments with them or actually play different games with them and try to pursue goals, get them jobs, get them married, and stuff like that. So I think that's probably the main thing is that people uh, have a context to put it in. Mm -hmm. You say dollhouse, and I know that was one of your early kind of test titles for the game. Um, you know, you, you have said that uh, in, in old interviews I've seen that you, you know, you kind of tested that name and didn't test too well with boys. What had, was your thought as far as marketing or de designing this game for both men and women, or boys and girls? Was there a thought that went into that, or did you just kind of see how it flew? <clears throat> yeah, actually, um, a lot of thought went into that. We wanted the game to be very open-ended, first of all, so that we weren't constraining the player to doing just what we wanted them to do. We wanted to leave a lot of just broad strategies you can pursue. Um, one thing, I was actually showing this game fairly early on to some uh, junior high students, and the first thing they kept asking me when they saw the game was, can they die? Can the Sims die? And I thought about that for a while, and it was interesting, because I don't think they wanted to be violent with the game, but they just wanted to get a sense of what the boundaries of the system were. And so they saw that they could eat and go to work and all that stuff, but if they could die, that kind of implied a much broader set of boundaries. And so... We really wanted the game to be as open as we could make it. Of course, we have to limit, you know, every game has got its limits. Um, but usually when we hit a limit, we tried to make things uh, customizable by the fans. So fans can actually put in new character skins, um, new objects, uh, put in their own music, their own MP3 music, and have it play off the stereo. And so we tried to make it malleable so that the fans could kind of take it in new directions, which they have done. And yeah, maybe you can talk a little bit about that since we're bringing up the fans. Um, tell me a little bit about this community that has grown up around this game. Well, initially we had uh, several fan sites that were covering the game before it was released. And in fact, we were um, actively giving them information on a weekly basis, you know, while we were in development. And also getting their input, you know, when we were thinking about new features and stuff, we would email them and they would tell us, oh, it's a great idea, or no, we don't really like it. Um, <clears throat> we also started building custom tools so the fans could customize the content before we released the game. So the day we released the game, we actually had quite a bit of custom skins and whatnot and wallpapers and floors on the net on the fan sites. And we had probably about 30 fan sites the day we shipped. And at that point, it just took off. And the game sold very well, and we released more tools. And so we've gotten a tremendous amount of buy-in from the fan community and a tremendous amount of participation. Another thing we've done is that on our website, 
we have free objects that you can download. If you register, you know, you buy the game, you register it, you go to our website, and you can download new objects into it. And so that got a lot of people comfortable with the idea of downloading new stuff into the game and kind of slowly expanding it. And so I think for a lot of people, this has become much more like a, uh, a hobby than a regular game. You know, most games you kind of buy them, you play them for 10 hours and then put them on the shelf. The Sims is something that you keep on your hard drive and then you slowly go out and collect more and more stuff for it. And everybody has kind of a customized collection of stuff that they then use to create their houses and families. So I think that's given it a lot of uh, longevity that it's had up to now. Mm -hmm. What are some of the examples that you've seen that have been, um, maybe you can start with some of the websites that have grown up around this game that you, you know, you're out there surfing the web and you know, you're losing searches on The Sims. What are some websites that you've seen that have caught your eye? Maybe you can tell some of those. Oh, there are a lot of really interesting ones. One thing about The Sims is that it's, it's themed very neutral. You know, unlike a lot of games that are very much, you know, uh, fantasy role-playing or modern military history, The Sims, everybody can kind of come in and take it in whatever direction they want to. So some of the sites <clears throat> actually kind of change the theme of The Sims, and they have, like, uh, horror sites. We can download horror skins and monsters in the game. There are other ones that are superhero sites um, or famous movies or TV shows. Uh, some of the better ones kind of go off in a lot of different directions. There's one called Seven Deadly Sims, and they have custom stuff for the game uh, based around the seven deadly sins. And so every sin has its stuff. So, like, you know, Lust has special beds and stuff, and Greed has high-end furniture. The, uh, there's another one called Sims Resource, which is pretty much kind of like a superstore of custom skins. Uh, they have something like 3,000, you know, character skins you can download into the game, 10,000 wallpapers. Uh, there's a great parody of The Onion called The Sims, which is kind of a comedy site. Uh, several news sites that are reporting on the other fan sites. Um, they just go off in all sorts of directions. What is The, uh, the, the Sims all about, the, the parody of The Onion? Uh, it's basically just a bunch of stuff parodying the game and the fan community. And so they have um, polls, they, have, they report on the other fan sites, but, you know, in a parody fashion. They have a thing called, you know, uh, is your sim hot or not? You know, I don't know if you've seen that website, but you can email your custom uh, skin, your character skin, to the site, and they put it up, and everybody rates it for attractiveness, and there's kind of this list of the most attractive sims that people have sent in. Uh, so it's really quite interesting. You know, we've um, sold close to 4 million copies of the sims, and so the fan community at this point is tremendous, uh, and we've gotten a lot of participation out of these people. A lot of the people who are buying the sims have never really played a computer game before. This is the first game that really hooked them. And frequently, it's a hardcore gamer, which is male, brings it home and plays it and then exposes it to his girlfriend or wife or sister. And they didn't used to be into games before, but they see this and they start playing it and they play it very heavily. And they actually, for them, it's their first computer game. And if you can imagine what it was like when you, you know, really got into computer games for the first time. Um, so they have potentially a lot more passion than your average gamer who goes through, you know, two or three games a month. Where do you see in your vision The Sims going? Um, you know, in just broad strokes, I mean, what, what would you like to see happen to this, this uh, series? I mean, much like SimCity has grown, uh, where, where could you see The Sims going? I think the, uh, the simulation is interesting and fun to play with, and making the characters believable uh, is a great hook that gets people really into the game. But long term, where people seem to find the most fun is in creating stories with the game. Um, rather than us as game designers creating a story saying, here, play our story, giving the players tools so that they can be the ones creating the story and then telling their story to their friends and sharing these stories. So long term, I think, uh, I'd like to see the Sims really evolve in that direction so that you're still in a very open-ended simulation environment and there's a lot of challenge and dealing with, you know, and very, uh, fairly unpredictable at some level. But at the same time, there is a much more dramatic presentation of what you've done. Um, the camera angles can change and become, you know, much more uh, cinematographic. The music can adapt, you know, and become spooky or lighthearted. Uh, laugh tracks can come and go. The actual behavior and events that occur in the game uh, should respond to the direction you're playing the game in. If I start doing really silly things in the game, <clears throat> the events that start driving, you know, a clown should show up at the front door. You know, just silly stuff should start appearing. You know, cream pie should uh, be in the next room that I walk into. If, on the other hand, I'm doing something very spooky, you know, and kind of a, a horror uh, 
like, then, you know, the lighting should get dark, the music should get spooky, you know, lightning and thunder should happen outside. And so that's where I really want to see the game heading, is to where the user, or the player starts feeling more like they're the director, in a sense. They're the director and possibly the actors. And the computer takes over aspects of the sound and lighting and cinematography. Um, and after they finish, you know, maybe they can even edit this to some degree and create, in fact, a little movie that they could then share and say, here's a little movie I created. Um, here's my story. Let me just ask you one more question. Um, are Sims alive? Alive? Um, depends on where you're asking. In the computer, no, I don't think so. But in a lot of people's heads, yeah, they are. Because um, really, what's happening here is that there's this uh, interface between uh, the computer here and the computer in front of you that's displaying on the screen. And it's the two together that synergistically create the Sims. So, you know, on the computer side, we're making the simulation that simulates uh, their daily ritual and their needs and whatnot. But really, the more uh, elaborate aspects of that simulation are occurring in your head, in your imagination. And so you're filling in all the details around them. And I think what we're trying to do is just prop up enough of an illusion such that they can become alive in your head. And for a lot of people, that does happen.